There are some investments that can make you money very quickly. We saw that happen with Amazon and Apple and Tesla during the tech boom. And then there are other investments that you want to own for life because these are things that can build you generational wealth. When you spend money most of the time, you are a consumer. Like if you go out to McDonald's and you buy a burger and you buy some fries and you eat it, you are consuming their products. When you invest your money, you become a producer. Now instead of you being the person that's buying the burgers, you're the one that's selling the burgers. Speaking of McDonald's, one way to do that is by actually investing in buying one of the McDonald's franchises. Now you own a McDonald's store, so if people are buying McDonald's sandwiches from you, you're the one making money. The other way you can do that is by investing in the McDonald's corporation, the actual stock. If you go onto the stock market and you buy one share of McDonald's, you become one of the owners of McDonald's. Now, if you just own one share of McDonald's, you're not going to get to tell them what to do and how to run their business, but you do get to share in the profits when McDonald's makes money. Now, the difference between being a real investor and being a flipper or a trader is how long you plan on owning your investment for. Like if you stick with McDonald's, if you plan on just buying and selling their stock in three months to make a quick profit, you're not an investor, you're a trader. If you plan on owning this investment for longer than a year, now you're classified as an investor. So if we draw this out, when you invest your money, you are using your money to be a producer, not just a consumer. Remember, when you're a consumer, you're just eating the product or using the product. When you're the producer, you're the one that's making money off of the product. So you're investing in being a producer, and when you invest your money, you have a time span of having your money invested for at least one year. What I want to talk about in this video is not just your regular investments. I want to talk about the investments you should be holding for your entire life because they're a little bit different than what you might think. I'm going to be going over five different investment types in this video, so make sure you watch this video until the end. But before I get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below because the way the YouTube algorithm works, if you do not smash that thumbs up button, then YouTube is much less likely to show you and other people our financial news and education videos. The first is real estate for residential purposes for reasons that you might not expect. Now, when I say real estate for residential purposes, I mean real estate where people live in. So this can be homes or apartments. I'm not calling it residential real estate because when people say residential real estate, that typically means we're talking about single family homes or small multifamily units up to four different units. When I say real estate for residential purposes, this can mean single family homes or this could mean big apartment complexes where people live in. The way real estate investing works is like this. Let's say you find this house right here on sale for $100,000 and you go through the property and you think it's a good property in a good area. So then you come in. So I'm going to draw you right here and I'm going to draw you with a nice mustache, of course. You come in and you buy this property for $100,000. Now you own this home right here, but you're not going to live in this home yourself. Instead, what you do is you are going to lease this home out to this person right here and maybe their family and they're going to live in your property but in exchange of this person living in your property, they're going to pay you $1,000 a month in rent every single month for them living in your property. Now, you can continue working your job like normal or you can go on vacation or do whatever you got to do and you will continue making this $1,000 a month every single month because this person needs a place to live and where they're living, they're living in your home. The reason I say you want to own real estate for residential purposes for life is because people will always need a place to stay no matter what happens to technology and no matter what happens in the future. People will always need a home. You can compare that to the past where people used to look at shopping malls and strip plazas as the thing to own in real estate. Well, as technology came and Amazon came and the shopping dynamic of the world changed, then shopping malls didn't become as attractive. There were people who made a ton of money in the strip mall and the shopping mall business. But now that industry is kind of dying because the whole shopping industry is changing. Same with office real estate. Real estate investors back in the day used to say that companies will always need a place to work. But then came the 2020 pandemic and then people realized that they can work from home which made office real estate not so attractive. Residential real estate is a little bit different because people will always need a roof over their heads. People will always need a bed to sleep on and people will always need a home to stay in. That makes it a lot easier for you to own real estate for the rest of your life because the only reason people won't want a home to live in is if people decide that they're more comfortable living on the streets. Now let's talk about why or why you don't want to own real estate for the rest of your life. So for the sake of this example, let's say over here you have a single family home and here you have an apartment complex both of which you can buy for one million dollars and let's assume for the sake of this example that if you rented out both of these properties after paying all of your expenses you would be left 
with $70,000 at the end of a year. So you buy each one of these and each one of these make you, let's just say $200,000 a year in rental income. And then you pay for all of your expenses, your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees. After paying all of your expenses, you are left with $70,000 worth of profit. And we're assuming that there's no debt. You're buying these properties with cash only. That means both of these properties are paying you a 7% annual return because here you're buying this house for a million dollars and you're making $70,000 a year in rental income profits. And here you're buying this apartment complex for a million dollars and you're making $70,000 a year in profits. But you also have to remember that just because you made $70,000 doesn't mean you get to keep $70,000 because the IRS wants their cut. You gotta pay taxes on this money. However, real estate does come with some legal tax loopholes. When you own real estate, as an investment, meaning you're not the one living here. You are renting out your property to somebody else and you get to tell the IRS, hey, this property that I own is one year older, so I deserve a tax break called the depreciation deduction on my taxes. And so you get to take a tax break on both of this income right here because you own investment real estate. But the size of your deduction is gonna be different here and here because this single family home is considered residential real estate and this apartment complex is considered commercial real estate. Residential real estate, so single family homes, two families, three families, and four family units, let you depreciate your property for 27 and a half years, while commercial real estate, so anything over four units, lets you depreciate this property over 30 nine years. I'm gonna explain what this means. So now what you're gonna do is you are gonna take the value of this building, not the land, the building itself, and divide it by the number of years that you can depreciate it on your taxes. So for the sake of these examples, let's assume that when you buy this $1 million property, $200,000 of which is going towards the land value because you know these properties sit on some land and $800,000 is for the building. So you're paying $200,000 for the land that this property is on and $800,000 is for the actual building. Once you know that, now you can do $800,000 divided by 27 and a half, which is, one second, $800,000 divided by 27 and a half, $29,000. So over here, you get a $29,000 tax break every year for 27 and a half years. And over here, $800,000 divided by 39, this is about $20,000. So here, you get a $20,000 tax break every single year for 39 years. What this allows you to do now is you buy this property, you make $70,000 a year, but you only pay taxes on $79,000 minus $29,000, so right around $41,000. You're only paying taxes on $41,000 worth of income for the first 27 and a half years. After 27 and a half years, you don't get this deduction anymore. Same thing here. Here, you make $70,000, but you only tell the IRS that you made $50,000, and you get to do that for 39 years. After 39 years, you don't get that deduction anymore, which is why a lot of people invest in real estate, but they have the goal of never holding it longer than 27 and a half or longer than 39 years. However, you also get some benefits if you own real estate for your entire life. So this is the reason why you wouldn't want to own real estate for your entire life because after 27 and a half years or after 39 years, you no longer get this tax break and so now you have to pay more money in taxes. And so if you don't want to pay more money in taxes, you might want to sell your property after 27 and a half years or after 39 years. That way you can take advantage of all these real estate tax breaks. However, let's go over why you might want to own real estate for your entire life. So now, same example. You buy either one of these properties for $1 million and you own it for some time and you're making rental money every single year. But now a few years go by and you find out that your property is now worth $5 million. So you got a lot of equity in this property because you bought it for $1 million and now it's worth $5 million. And now you're thinking, yeah, I want to give this property or this money to my kids. Now, one thing that you can do is you can sell this property and get $5 million worth of cash but now you have millions of dollars worth of profit because you bought this property for $1 million and you're selling it for $5 million. So you're gonna have a pretty big tax bill where you're gonna have to give a big chunk of this money to the IRS in taxes. The alternative, assuming you do not sell this property for cash when you're alive and you own these properties, either one, until you die. Now when you die, your estate gives this property, either one, to your heirs, your kids. Now what happens is your kid is gonna get this property and the government is going to say that your kid got the property, they bought it for $5 million. So if your kid went out and they sold this property today for $5 million after you die, they will get this $5 million of cash 
and they don't have to pay any taxes on this money because to the government, it looks like they bought the property for $5 million. This concept is called stepped up basis. And essentially what it's saying is if you die with this property, then the person you give this property to essentially can say that they bought the property for how much it's worth when you die. So now if you get here, you don't have to worry about selling your property for a profit and then paying taxes and then giving this cash to your kid. What you can do is let this property live with you for the rest of your life. And then when you die, you give this property to your kid. And now what you have to worry about is estate taxes, but you get a much bigger kind of cushion with estate taxes because you have to be gifting millions of dollars before any estate taxes come into play. Now I do gotta let you know, although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. So if you have specific tax questions or legal questions, talk to a professional in your area. The last reason why I say real estate is an investment that you wanna own for your entire life is because with real estate, you own something tangible that you can see, feel and touch and this is something that can continue to provide you income and income growth for the rest of your life because if there's demand for this property, wherever it is, then what you're gonna see happen is more people are gonna wanna live there, which means the rent that you charge can go up too. So now as things become more expensive because of inflation, the amount of money you make every single year also increases because there's more demand to live in the property that you own. The second thing you wanna own for life is the stock market in general. And when I say the stock market in general, I don't mean investing in stocks the way most people talk about investing in stocks. I talk a lot about investing on a YouTube channel from real estate investing to stock market investing, which is why if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, you should do that. But when most people talk about stock market investing, they're trying to find the next hot stock. How can you find the next Tesla or the next Amazon or the next Apple before it makes it big? Now you can make a lot of money if you find the next hot stock, but that might not be something you wanna own for the rest of your life because well, Tesla could fail. Amazon could go bankrupt and people might stop liking iPhones. Now I know what you're probably thinking. Oh, just but Amazon can't ever fail. They're a powerhouse. How could anything be bigger than Amazon? Well, that's exactly what people used to think about Sears. Sears used to be the monster retailer. And back in the day, people used to think that there would never be a Sears competitor because they were so huge. Well, now times have changed, technology has changed, and Sears is bankrupt. Companies will change, technology will change, people will change, but one thing, if you believe in the United States and if you believe in the American economy, one thing that won't change is the economy. So if you believe in the American economy, what you want to be betting on is the American economy because while companies like Sears might come and fail and JCPenney might come and fail and Circuit City might come and fail and Hertz might come and fail and California Pizza Kitchen might come and fail, the American economy has continued to grow. The closest way for you to get actual exposure to the American economy is to invest in the broader stock market as a whole, and that would be through funds like VOO and SPY. These are two different ETFs, exchange traded funds, which allow you to invest in the broader stock market because both of these funds give you exposure to the top 500 companies in the United States. So both of these funds give you exposure to the S&P 500. Now I wanna give you a little caveat here because the United States economy and the stock market are similar, but two different things. The economy is the economy. This is our companies, and this is how many people have jobs, and this is how well our economy is doing. The stock market is where people bet their money based off of how well they think the economy is doing. So while they're similar, they are different because when people put their money in the stock market, they're betting that the economy is gonna do well in the future. The way you invest in these funds is the same way you invest in any other company. You just go into your stock brokerage and then buy these funds as opposed to buying something like Tesla or Amazon. Now, I should also remind you that when you invest your money, you are never guaranteed to make money. You might even lose money when you invest, which is why you should always, always, always do your own due diligence and never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. But when you invest in funds like these, now what you're doing is you are essentially betting on the growth of the American economy. You're not trying to get rich overnight. You are just betting on the slow and steady growth of the economy. If the economy is growing and our companies are growing and companies are making more money, well then chances are these funds are gonna continue to make you more money too. By the way, if you do wanna learn more about how to actually invest your money in the stock market and grow your money and find a good stock brokerage to use, our team put together a very comprehensive article that goes over all of that and you can read it on our website, theminoritymindset.com and I'll also link it for you in the description below. The advantage with owning something like this for the rest of your life is now you don't gotta worry about changing trends because like I said before, companies will change, people will change, and technology will change. 
but the economy will continue to grow. So as companies come and go, these funds will kick out the companies that are not doing too good and they will add in the companies that are doing better. So if a company is no longer one of the top 500 companies, it will get kicked out of these funds and then these funds will add in a new company who is now one of the top 500 companies. Now the difference between owning something like this and owning real estate is with real estate, typically you're investing in real estate for passive income. So you're going to make investing decisions based off of how much money you're making every single month. Here, you do get some passive income from dividends but it's not going to be as much as the amount of passive income you're getting from real estate. However, you do get the stepped up basis here like you did in real estate. So if you invest $1 million here and over your lifetime this goes up to $5 million, well, you could sell your investment and pay taxes and then give this money to whoever you want to give it to or you can own these investments for the rest of your life and if you don't have to use this money and you die with these assets, well now they can go to your kids or whoever you want it to go to and they will own these assets and when they sell it, if they sell it for $5 million, which is how much it's worth when you die, they won't have to pay any capital gains taxes on that. The third thing you want to own for life is gold with an asterisk because this should be a small part of your portfolio. No more than 5-10% to of your entire portfolio because gold is not there to make you wealthy. It is there to protect you against a worst case scenario type of situation. Your stocks and your real estate are what you own to fund your retirement, to create more passive income, and to build your wealth. Your gold is almost like financial insurance. It's there to protect you against something horrible happening in the economy. There's a few different ways that you can invest in gold. You can invest in companies that mine in gold. Now you're not actually investing in gold, you're investing in companies that mine in gold. And as gold prices go up, these companies make more money because there's more of a demand for gold. Or the second thing you can do is invest in gold certificates. So now you're investing almost like gold stocks. You're investing in a fund that gives you exposure to actual gold. So a company owns physical gold and now you're investing in a fund that this company created which gives you exposure to their actual gold. So it's a little bit of a derivative but it gives gives you exposure to physical gold. And the third thing that you can do is invest in physical gold bars. So if we're talking about owning gold, the ideal thing to do is own the physical gold bars because that gives you the most insurance because this is something you can see, feel, and touch and it's something that you can control. Again, this should not be a huge part of your portfolio and this should not be something you're stressing about. And if you don't have any other investments, you should not be worried about buying gold right now. The first thing you need to be worried about is buying the real estate, buying the stocks, buying the things that are actually going to make you money. Once you establish yourself and once you have some real financial assets, that's when you can think about adding some gold, remember asterisk, adding some gold to your portfolio. Gold comes in handy in worst case scenario type of situations. So when we talked about investing in stocks, we're betting on the American economy because if the economy continues to grow, well then the stock market is going to grow. But if the economy completely fails and our dollar becomes worthless and people have no money, well this is where gold could have value. Gold is the original currency and a lot of people believe that if the dollar were to fail, then people would revert back to gold. If you remember back during the Great Depression, there were countries in the world that saw hyperinflation where people would have to take literally a wheelbarrow full of cash in order to afford a loaf of bread because then gold became so expensive. And so the thought is if the worst case scenario type of situation happened and the economy crashes and the dollar goes to nothing, well then people will go back to things like gold because this is a tangible currency and this was the original currency. You know, people have been betting on a doomsday situation like that for decades and decades and decades and to date they've been wrong every single time which is why you want to make sure you're investing in your wealth first, but you always want to protect yourself because yeah, there's a chance that things could go really bad, which is why you want to own some gold. Going along with that, the fourth thing you want to consider owning for the rest of your life is some cryptocurrency. So this is what's considered the new digital gold. Gold was the original currency and many people believe that cryptocurrency and blockchain will be involved in our future currency. Now look, there's a lot of speculation around cryptocurrency and there's a lot of guessing around what cryptocurrency will be in the future and nobody can predict the future which is why again, we got this asterisk here because this needs to be a small percentage of your portfolio, okay? This is not something you want to bet your entire life savings on. This is something where you want to put some money because there's a lot of potential with cryptocurrency and there's a lot of potential with blockchain. However, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. Again, this should not be your first investment. Get the things that are proven first out of the way. Own your stocks, own your real estate, own the things that are going to make you wealthy and pay you with passive income. Then once you do that, you can put some money here. And fifth, the last investment we're talking about that you want to own for life are commodities that you need to survive. So 
One way to kind of think about this is you might have heard examples of super wealthy people and rich people that have these bunkers in their homes that protect them against any nuclear blast. And inside of these bunkers, they have food and rations that will survive them for years. Now, I'm not saying you need to spend a million dollars building an underground bunker below your home, but you should consider investing in some commodities that people will need to survive. So one example of this is water. If you've ever seen the movie The Big Short, great movie by the way, which talks about the 2008 real estate collapse, at the end of the movie, they talked about how this guy was investing in water because we have a limited supply of water in the world and our demand and our needs for water keep going up. We need water in order to survive. It's a commodity to survive. And so this is not something that's gonna make you rich overnight. But if the demand and the need for water go up and our supply of water is limited, well, this could create a real problem in the future. And so you want to be kind of a proactive thinker and start thinking about things on how to take care of yourself and your finances in this case. And one way that you can get exposure to that is by investing in, again, companies that clean or store water or investing in water ETFs that give you exposure to the water commodity. Another thing that you can potentially consider is look at investing in a farm, an actual farm for your family, just in case, because we never know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, we have a lot of tension in the world and let's say things go bad. If you have a farm, well, now you can kind of be self-sufficient. You can grow your own food and have things to take care of yourself and take care of your family. Again, this is a commodity to survive. Is this something that's going to make you rich overnight? No, but you're protecting yourself against anything. If you're finally starting to get paid and now your boss comes to you and says that, hey, you can invest your money in a 401k or a 403 or a 457 and you have no idea what these things mean and you don't know how to invest your money and you want to start investing for the first time, you are in the right place. Making your first investment can be scary and it's a whole new world that most of us are never exposed to. You hear all these terms like the IRA and then the 401k and then some of you might be hearing about a 403b or a 457 7B and now you don't know where to start. Do you take one of these tax deferred retirement accounts or do you open up your own investment account or do you start investing in mutual funds or index funds or ETFs? And so in this video, I want to start breaking all of this down. That way you know how you can start investing for the first time. That way you can make smart decisions with your money. That way you can build up this new nest egg that will make you wealthy. The inspiration for this video came because a good friend of mine who is now a brand new doctor got his first job and has finally started to get paid and his boss offered him a few different investment options. A 403B and a 457. 7B, and he had no idea what these things were. He did not know what an IRA was. And so he called me and asked me, how do I make my first investment? This is the first time I'm starting to make money. So what do I do with my money? How do I now build wealth? And unfortunately, regardless of how much schooling you go through, most of us are never taught a thing about how to invest our money to become wealthy. That way we can actually be financially free. So here's what I want to do. I want to start by going over the different tax deferred retirement accounts. These are things like the 401k, the IRA, the 403b, the 457. 7B. I want to go over what they are, how they work, how to invest in them. And then I want to give you my thoughts on them. That way you can get my opinion. After that, I want to go over ways that you can invest your money yourself. This would be things like mutual funds, ETF stocks. And then I want to go over alternative investment options. That way you can think outside of the box and know the different ways that you can invest your money. That way you can build your wealth. So let me start here with the tax deferred retirement accounts. These tax deferred retirement accounts are the most popular ways for people to invest your money because a lot of these are completely automated. When you invest in your 401k or your 403b or your 457, a lot of times you're going to be working directly with your employer and now your employer is going to help you set up this account and anytime you get paid, some of your money is directly going to go into your retirement account and this money is going to sit there until you hit close to retirement age and then you will be able to pull your money out. The reason why people like these tax deferred accounts is because they are tax deferred. You have the option to not pay any taxes on the money that you invest today or you can pay your taxes today and then you don't have to pay taxes when you pull your money out in the future. So within all four of these accounts, you have a traditional version and then you have a Roth version. The traditional version, so a traditional 401k, traditional IRA, traditional 403b, traditional 457b, all these things mean that you do not pay any taxes today. You invest your money today and then this money gets to grow tax-free. So every time you make a profit, you don't have to pay taxes on it. And then when you start pulling this money out when you're a whole lot older, that's when you pay taxes when you pull the money out. With the Roth, it's the opposite. 
with the Roth option, Roth 401k, IRA, 403b, 457b, you pay taxes on your money today, and then this money goes into your account. I'm gonna go over why the tax difference matters and which option is better for you in just a second, but let's start by going over what the difference between these different retirement accounts are. So your 401k, your 403b, and your 457b are all essentially the same thing, it's just who can offer that plan. Your 401k is typically reserved just for your private companies, your private employers. You do see some government companies or some big nonprofits offer 401ks, but most of the time it's only gonna be a private employer. Your 403Bs are for government employees and for your nonprofits. And then your 457 plan is for people like teachers and first responders and city officials. The biggest difference between these three plans is gonna be with your 457B because what the 457B says is if you pull your money out of your retirement account before you are 59 and a half years old, you don't have to face a penalty. But if you pull your money out with a 401k or a 403b before that 59 and a half years old, then you're gonna be subject to a 10% penalty on the money that you pull out. So this has a little different rule where you can pull your money out and you don't gotta worry about that fee, but you got that fee here. The next major difference isn't on the legal side, it's more on the practical side, because what you're gonna see happen with a lot of companies is a lot of companies are gonna give you some sort of 401k match. If you invest $100 into your 401k, they might give you $30 or $100, they might match a dollar for dollar, just depending on who your corporation is. But a lot of times you're not gonna see those types of matches in the 403b and the 457b just because of the way that they work. So a lot of times you're not gonna see the same match options here, but you will see that here, which makes the 401k more attractive to a lot of people. So the way that these accounts work is you can open up a 401k, 403, or 457b, your employer will tell you how. Once you open an account, you will be able to automatically invest some of your paycheck into these accounts. Again, you can do the traditional way or the Roth way, I still gotta talk about that. But you can invest your money into these accounts, and once your money is in these accounts, you can kind of decide how you want your money invested. Now, you're not gonna be able to invest your money completely by yourself. Typically, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick which kind of funds that you want to invest your money in. So you're gonna be limited, typically, as to who and where you can invest your money because when you open these accounts, your employer is working with some sort of institution on how you can invest your money. So you'll typically get some sort of brochure, some sort of investment pamphlet that will go over your different investment options, and then you'll be able to see where you want to invest your money. And then you'll be able to pick, do you want to be more aggressive with your investments? Do you want to be more conservative with your investments? And based off of that, your money will be invested into these funds based off of what your investment criteria are. The thing that I need you, need you, need you to please understand are fees. Because what so many people do not understand about these retirement accounts are the fees that they're paying. Now at this point you might be thinking, wait, my 401k is charging me a fee? Yes, they are. Are. When you invest your money into these funds, these funds charge a fee to manage your money. And some funds are gonna charge you a whole lot more than other funds. So what you need to do is you need to look at something called the expense ratio. This expense ratio is gonna tell you what the fees are for the funds that you're invested in. Some of these fees are gonna be upwards of 1% or even 2% of your assets a year. That means if you invest $100, they're gonna take $1 or $2, depending on what the fee is, right off the top, every single year whether or not you make money. But there are other accounts that will charge you a fraction of that and they will get you similar returns. So if you have a retirement account right now, do me a favor, open up your brokerage account and see what your expense ratio is. That way you can see what it's costing you every single year. Generally, now this is not something that you need to always follow, but generally, if it's costing you more than 0.75%, that would be considered a high fee. So just something to keep in mind. An IRA works essentially the same as these other three, except now you're not doing it through your employer you're managing your IRA on your own because an IRA stands for an individual retirement account so this means you can go to your bank you can go to any financial institution you can open up an IRA and now you are the one in charge you're not doing it through your employer you can create an IRA wherever you want and then when you create your own IRA you have the option now to again invest the money the way that you want if you go to a specific brokerage or if you go to a specific bank they're going to give you their own investment options or you can create something called a self self-directed IRA where now you have the ability to invest your money yourself. But essentially the thing that you need to understand about an IRA is that this is a way for you to invest your money on your own and get those tax benefits that people look for with these accounts. Which brings me to the topic of understanding the difference between a traditional or a Roth investment. So again, a traditional investment means that you're going to pay taxes on the money that you invest not today but when you pull it out and a Roth investment means you're going to pay taxes today and then you're not going to pay taxes when you pull your money out. 
The reason why people like this traditional investment is because, well, you don't have to pay any taxes today. You invest your money into your account, you let your money grow, and then when it comes time for you to retire, you're going to pull your money out, and that's when you're going to pay taxes. The reason people like that is because people say, okay, well, when I pull my money out, I'm going to be old, I'm not going to be working a job, so even if tax rates go up, it's not as big of a deal because, well, I'm going to have no income. And if I have no income, then my tax rates are gonna be lower. So when I pull my money out, I'm gonna have a lower tax rate so I can pay less taxes because now my money can grow essentially tax-free. Then I pull my money out and then I'll pay taxes when I have no income at a lower tax rate. People who follow the Roth model will say, well, I don't know what's gonna go on with tax rates. I think that because the United States national debt is skyrocketing and I don't see our national government spending slowing down, I think the government is gonna to wanna to raise taxes. And if they raise taxes, it will be more beneficial for me to pay my taxes today than when I pull my money out. Plus, you might also be thinking, hey, you know, I'm investing a lot of my money. I'm trying to build more income. I'm trying to build assets. So my goal is when I turn 60 or 65 is not to have a little bit of income. My goal is to have a whole bunch of income when I'm older. So it's more beneficial for me to pay my taxes today because I want to really be wealthy and I want to create a whole bunch of income streams. So you just gotta figure out what your goal is and what your financial plan is. If you plan on not doing anything and not having any other income when you're 60 and not having any assets or investments that are gonna pay you, then sure, a traditional is gonna make more sense. But if you plan on buying additional assets every single year and you plan on building and stacking your additional streams of income, that by the time it comes to your retirement, you're gonna be having a whole bunch of income, well then this is gonna make a whole lot more sense. This is what a lot of the minority mindset people do because we're working to build assets. We're working to create new income streams. That way you can make a whole lot of money, not a little bit of money as you get older. Now that you understand how these tax deferred retirement accounts work, let me tell you my opinions on them because I don't have any of these tax deferred retirement accounts. I invest my money on my own. I don't use any of these tax deferred retirement accounts because for me, I can get better tax breaks and get a better use of my money today instead of using one of these accounts. Now let me make sure that I'm very clear with this because what I do isn't for everybody. For the average person, hey, these are fine. But I am very involved with my investments. I like to be active with my investments. I have different strategies and different goals with my investments which give me different tax breaks. And because of that, I don't have any use for these investments. But if you are not into investing your money, if you're not really into being that involved with your money, you're just looking for passive ways to invest your money, and you don't wanna create whole new streams of income, then hey, this is a great way for you to get some tax benefits and invest your money on the side. I don't like the idea of my money being tied up in an investment where I can't pull my money out if I wanted to. And if I did, I'm gonna be penalized. I don't like the idea of my money being tied up in an investment or where I don't have a say of how my money is gonna be invested. And I don't like the idea of my money being invested into a fund where I can't control the fees or where now I'm subject to higher fees than if I just invested the money into a fund outside of one of these retirement accounts. My investment goals are very different than most people's investment goals because I'm not working for a traditional retirement. I'm investing my money very differently, which is why I don't need these and I don't need to create a fund where I'll be able to access it when I'm 60 years old and then have this nest egg that I can live off of. That's not my investment goal. But again, for the average person, if you're just starting off, this is a great way for you to start, but this should not be your sole investment plan and it should not be your sole retirement plan, which brings me to number two, investing your money yourself. You do not have to invest your money into a tax deferred retirement account or to a 401k to invest your money. There are ways for you to invest your money outside of these accounts. And if your employer is not giving you a match or if they're not giving you free money to invest into one of these retirement accounts, then you might get some extra benefits by investing your money yourself because now your money is not tied up anywhere. Now, you're not gonna get the same tax benefits here than you would if you used a 401k or an IRA or a 403b or a 457b, but now you have the full control over your investments and you can access your money anytime you want. There are four very accessible ways for you to invest your money into the stock market Market without going through your traditional tax deferred retirement account. You can invest in a mutual fund, you can invest in an index fund, you can invest in an ETF, and you can invest in stocks. All of these things allow you to invest in stocks just in different ways. So the stock market is a place where you can go to invest your money into your favorite companies and it is a way for you to bet on the future of our economy. So if you think the economy is going to go up, well now you have a way to invest and get a share of that upside by investing your money into the stock market. If you go out and you buy one share of the 
Amazon company, well now you become one of the part owners of Amazon. The reason why this can be intimidating or this can be hard is because a lot of people don't want to spend the time, effort, or research trying to figure out which company to invest in, or they don't want to be an investor themselves, they just want it to be passive. They want to invest their money and get some of the upside. This is why things like the 401k and the IRA have become so popular because they are a very passive and easy way for someone to just invest their money and let their investments do their thing. But the thing that you have to understand is that your 401k and your IRA were never intended. They were never intended to be your sole retirement plan. Even the founder of the 401k has come out and said that the 401k has gone awry because everybody believes that the 401k is all they need in order to be financially successful when they retire. But that's not the case. You're going to have to invest more money outside of your 401k, which means you need to invest your money yourself. But that doesn't mean that you have to be doing stock picks. It doesn't mean you have to actively manage your investments every single day if that's not what you want to do. There are other ways for you to invest your money outside of your tax deferred accounts, which are also passive. Mutual funds, index funds, and ETFs all work very similarly in that they are a basket of stocks. When you invest in any one of these three, what you're doing is you're investing into a fund that's giving you exposure to a whole bunch of stocks. So instead of you trying to invest in 100 different companies, you can invest in a fund that's invested in 100 different companies, and now you're getting exposure to these 100 different companies without having to actually invest in every single one. The whole idea here is you are limiting your risk because now you are not trying to figure out which companies to invest in. You're putting your money into a fund, and these funds invest in a whole bunch of companies. It might be 30 companies, it might be 500 companies. So this fund invests in a whole bunch of companies, and you're getting exposure to all these companies to lower your risk. That way now, if one of the companies in your fund goes bankrupt, you're okay because now you still have a whole bunch of other companies which are gonna help balance out that loss. Each one of these funds work a little bit differently. A mutual fund is known as an actively managed fund, which means that now this fund has a manager, a money manager who is getting paid to now find the best company to invest in. So this person is now gonna be buying and selling stocks, they're gonna be researching companies, and they're gonna be trying to get you the best returns possible. That's what a mutual fund is. An index fund and an ETF are passive investments. That means instead of having an expensive money manager, you have a computer, and this computer has an algorithm, and this algorithm is gonna say, okay, we want to invest in, let's just say, the biggest 500 companies on the stock market. And now if one of the companies in your list goes lower or they go bankrupt, this computer is gonna kick that company out and put a new company in. So it's passively managed, which means that here and here, your fees are a whole lot less than here because now you have to pay for an expensive money manager. So this is one of the reasons why people really like ETFs and index funds because your fees are a whole lot less and most money managers, most mutual funds cannot outperform the market year after year after year, especially after you factor in the fees. So here with this and this, you can just get exposure to the market. When the market goes up, you get the same returns. When the market goes down, you will also see your fund go down. There are ways for you to invest in the general stock market. There are ETFs and index funds that give you exposure to the general stock market and your fees are a whole lot less. So here, you're paying less fees and you can get the general returns of the stock market versus here you're trying to beat the stock market but you're gonna pay higher fees and most money managers cannot beat the stock market over the long run. ETFs and index funds work very similarly except the way that they trade because ETFs trade differently than index funds. ETFs trade just like stocks. You can buy and sell shares of an ETF just like any other stock. You can buy it in the morning, sell it in the evening if you wanted to. Don't recommend doing that, but you can. And you have no investment minimum to invest in an ETF. Sure, you just need the money to buy the share of an ETF unless you're buying fractional shares of it. But you have no investment minimum versus an index fund. You're typically gonna have some sort of investment minimum. It might be in $1,000, it might mean $10,000 depending on which index fund you're investing in. But you have an investment minimum and you can't trade it the way that you can an ETF. With an index funds, it's not trading all day long. It usually just makes one trade in the morning and that's it. So if you wanna sell your index fund, you would have to wait until the next day as opposed to an ETF. You can trade it just like any other stock. In terms of your actual investment though, you're getting the same thing here and here. You're both getting your low cost to invest and you get kind of the same investments. Like you have ETFs that give you exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market and you also have index funds that give you exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. So so the whole idea with index funds is it's really made just for the long-term investor who is not interested in trading. It is just a very passive way for you to invest your money for the long term. With ETFs, same concept except now you can trade in and out of it very easily. And then you have the ability to invest in individual stocks. So these are more of your long-term, your passive ways to invest
invest your money in the stock market, if you don't want to be an active investor, if you don't want to research companies, if you don't want to keep up with all the financial news, hey, just invest your money in any of these three. And now you have an additional way to invest your money. You just keep putting money into these investments every week or every two weeks or every month. You're just going to keep investing in these things when the market is up and down. You're just gonna keep putting money in there and they're gonna let your money grow and compound over time. So that's the strategy here. With stocks, it's very different. If you wanna be more active with your investments, you have the ability to earn more money because now you can try to find the best companies to invest in. Now obviously that has more risk because you can invest your money into a company and then see you go bankrupt and how you lose your old investment but you also have the ability to earn more money because now you can invest in the company before it really just takes off. Because if you can research companies, you find a company that you believe is hot and then it takes off after you buy it, well now you get to share in all the upside because you are an owner in that company. The mistake that so many people make when they're investing in the stock market is first they ask, okay, I wanna invest my money in the stock market, what stock should I buy? Instead of trying to figure out, okay, what is my strategy? What is my goal? How do I want to invest? They just want to know what stock to buy. And then what happens is they buy on emotion. They say, yeah, I want to be a long-term investor because everybody knows that your long-term investors make the most money sustainably. You can make a lot of money in the short term as a trader, but traders also lose a lot of their money. I mean, something like 80% of traders end up losing money over a period of 12 months. But now you say, okay, I want to be a long-term investor because I know that's how I can make money. That's how Warren Buffett made all his money. I want to be a long-term investor. And then you find a hot stock to invest in, you put your money in there, and then four months go by, and you see your stock in the red. You see your stock down, and now you start to panic. They have a bad earnings, they have a bad quarter, and now you start to get really worried. You don't know what's gonna go on with this company, you're losing money, and now you sell. You panic, and you just get out, and now you lost money. This is where you need to have a strategy. And again, why if you want to be investing in stocks, you have to understand what that entails because now you need to be doing the research. The way you do that as an investor is you have to look at the fundamentals of a company. That means you need to understand the cash flows. You need to understand the profit and loss. You need to look at all the financials. Look at the numbers. Are they profitable? If so, how are they profitable? How much money are they making? Where are their expenses? Where are they investing? If they're not profitable, how do they plan to be profitable? So you want to look at the numbers, come up with a valuation. Then you also have to look at the non-numbers. You need to look at the company itself. Who are the executives? Are they innovating? What kind of products are they creating? Do they have a loyal fan base? How hard is it for another company to come in and compete? What is their real like secret sauce? What makes them special? If you can come up with this and you can come up with a good valuation, then you can look at the actual trading price of a company and then you can say, hey, I think this company is undervalued and it has a lot of upside. And so that will be an opportunity for you to invest. But if you look at the numbers and you say, you know, I think this company is too expensive. I don't want to invest. These are the type of questions you need to be asking yourself. And this is what every fundamental long-term investor is doing. They're looking at companies. They're trying to see what these companies are doing and they want to value these companies based off of their own metrics. And based off of that, if the company is trading for a price that is lower than what they think their valuation is worth, then they're gonna come in and buy. If the company is worth more than what they think it's worth, then they're not gonna buy. This is what you need to be doing as an investor and it takes time and it takes practice. I'm gonna jump back into the video in just one second, but before we do, if you are an investor and you're looking for an easy and free way to stay up to date on what's happening in the top financial news from the economy to the housing market to the stock market to the crypto market to the global economy, then you have to check out Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial news editor that I created that will keep you up to date on what's happening in the financial news. You can read the news editor in less than five minutes every morning. It's the fun and easy to read email and it's completely free so if you haven't joined market briefs yet i got the link to how you can join down in the description below this brings me to number three alternative investments because there's more ways for you to invest your money outside of the stock market like i love investing my money in real estate i also have money in cryptocurrency i also have money in commodities like physical gold and i also invest in startups and other businesses there are ways for you to invest your money outside of the stock market if you want to be more involved with your money and these allow you to get paid in a variety of ways. Let me start by talking about real estate. When I invest in real estate, I don't just buy a property with the goal of trying to sell it for a huge profit. When I buy a property, my goal is to get cash flow. So if I buy a property for let's just say $150,000, I'm gonna buy this property not with the intention of selling it for 200,000, I'm buying it because now I know that this property is gonna rent out for $1,500 a month 
every month. And now what I've done is I've created a new passive stream of income. So now I own this asset, I own the real estate, somebody's gonna live there, a family's gonna use this property, they're gonna live there, they're gonna get the value out of this property, and in exchange, they're gonna pay my company, my real estate company, rent every single month. And now $1,500 is coming into my account every single month, and I don't really have to do any work. I have a property management company who I've hired to do all the day-to-day -day work, and they're the ones that when something goes wrong with the property, they call the property management company. So yeah, all the $1,500, isn't profit, some of that money is going to the property management company, some of the money is going to taxes, some of the money is going to go to maintenance fees and management fees, and if you have a mortgage on the property, some of the money is going to go to debt, but if you do it right, it's also going to put some money in your pocket every single month passively, and now what you've done is you've created a new stream of income. Plus, as an attorney who's not your attorney, I can tell you that real estate also offers some of the best tax breaks that our tax code has to offer. So when you invest in real estate, not only can you get cash flow, but you can also get legal tax breaks. With cryptocurrency, it's very different. Cryptocurrency is a much more speculative and it's a much more risky and volatile investment in the sense that you can see cryptocurrency rise and fall very fast. But you have to understand, again, why are you investing? I like cryptocurrency because it's the people's movement of money. People are losing their trust in the Federal Reserve Bank, they're losing their trust in the Treasury Department, and so people are looking for alternative ways to store their money, to store their wealth, and one of the ways that they're doing that is with cryptocurrency, and you also have a lot of powerful technology behind cryptocurrency. Again, very risky, and if you don't know what you're doing and you just dump your money into it, then you might be very disappointed if you see cryptocurrency prices go down. Again, this is where education is so important, and if you wanna learn more about cryptocurrency, I'll link an interview that I did with a cryptocurrency expert going over how cryptocurrency works and how you can invest in it, and I'll link that for you in the description. With gold, is very different. I own physical gold, not a gold ETF, but actual physical gold, and I look at gold as real money. I don't look at gold as an investment. I don't care if gold prices go up or down. For me, gold is real money because it represents a store of value. It takes time, effort, and labor to mine an ounce of gold, so it really represents value as opposed to our dollars, which aren't backed by anything tangible. It's not backed by gold or silver or anything else. It's backed by a promise by the United States government that our dollars have value. And because of that, the value of our dollars can be manipulated, they can be diluted, and so I own physical gold as a protection against that. But again, I don't look at gold as an investment that's gonna make me rich. I look at gold as an asset, as a money, that I keep as a store of value. And then I invest in businesses because I'm an entrepreneur and I love working with other entrepreneurs. Obviously, we have here Minority Mindset, a company, but I also invest in other startups. So I like working with other startup founders and the way that I work with these companies is not just by giving them cash, but I like actually working with the companies. I like working with the founders to help advise them, to help them grow. That way we can take this company and help solve more problems, which will help the company grow even bigger because an entrepreneur's job is to solve a problem. If you can solve a problem for a lot of people, well now this company will be able to grow bigger. So this again is highly risky. You can lose all of your money by investing in startups, but you also have the ability to earn more money because now if a company that you invested in grows big and then they go public or they get acquired, well now you can get a big payday. But again, highly risky and you have to be involved to understand what you're doing and you have to be willing to understand and take that risk. Now some of these can be very hard to do, like investing in real estate can be difficult because you need access to a lot of capital. And investing in businesses can be hard because if you want to go and invest in a startup, you might need a lot of money or have the right connects to do that. And investing in gold can be hard because you don't know where to do that. So these things can be difficult, but technology has made it easier for the people that are willing to learn. For example, with real estate, you don't have to invest in physical real estate to get exposure and the upside of real estate. You have platforms out there which allow you to invest in crowdfunded real estate. That way now, you don't have to buy an entire property. You don't have to be the person that deals with tenants. You don't have to be the person that gets the call when the toilet is broken. You're just investing into a fund which gives you exposure to that type of real estate. With businesses, before, if you wanted to invest in a startup, you had to go and find the companies and go pitch to the startup or have the startup pitch to you. And so then you had to find the right companies they'd have to come to you and make a deal to invest in them. Now, thanks to crowdfunding, you can invest in startups with as little as like $100, and now you can go and invest in some of these companies. Again, highly risky, but now you can get exposure to these companies at an early stage, that way if they go big, you got in early because now you were able to do that thanks to technology. The key for any of this to work 
is that when you get paid now, you have to allocate a portion of your money to your investments. If you're just getting started, that might mean the 401k or IRA or 403b or 457b. But as you start to be more involved and as you start to see the upsides of investing and as you want to be more active in your investments, you might say, hey, I want to see what other investments there are or how can I be more involved in my investments or how can I invest my money myself? This is where you have to understand, okay, I'm getting paid. You take a portion of your paycheck. This is money that I have to invest. Now you can see all the different places that you can invest your money because different investments will have different upsides, different goals. Real estate is cash flow. Gold is preservation of your wealth. Cryptocurrency, you're trying to see more upside. And business, you're trying to see more upside as well by investing in these early stage companies. So every investment has a different goal. And when you have that goal, now you just need to understand where you want to invest. And this is where your financial education comes in, but it all starts with understanding how to take that initial money and knowing where to put it. That way you can start to see that upside and start to use your money as a tool to build your wealth. Financial planning is one of those things that we're all expected to know how to do, even though most of us are never taught how. Well, maybe if you had financially savvy parents, they told you to save a little bit of money and maybe if you're up for it, invest a little bit of money too. The problem is if you don't give your money a plan, then your money will leave. Money, where'd you go? Come out, come out wherever you are. The majority of people have a three-part financial plan that looks something like this. They make money and then they spend money and then they wonder where all their money went. Okay money, you can come back now, but it doesn't have to be like that. Look, if you can order Chipotle with extra guac and get it delivered to your doorstep without ever leaving your sofa, then you can come up with a budget that will help you build your wealth. You just wanna make sure that your budget sets you up for building wealth instead of just getting by because there's a big difference between these two types of budgeting. The first thing you need to do is figure out where all your money is going. Money where, oh, there you are. Why do you keep hiding from me? This is the part that nobody likes doing because you're gonna have to talk with yourself about your spending habits. What did I tell you about paying $700 for scarves? It's almost like when you were in high school and then your teacher would pass back your test results and you would see that, oh my God, you were so close to an A, but you had made 15 careless mistakes. Maybe that was just me, but you have to do the same thing now with your money, except you have to be the one that grades yourself. We're gonna do this the old school way. So I want you to clean off your kitchen counter and bust out your bank statements, your payroll statements, and your credit card statements. Now, write down how much money you made last month and then write down where all of your money went. So write all of your expenses and write how much money you saved and how much money you invested. Wow. Before you can make a plan on what to do with your money, you need to know where all your money is going. Huh, so guac is really extra, huh? Hopefully looking at your money is gonna be the inspiration that you need to go out and make a better plan with your money because that's exactly what we're gonna do now. An average financial plan does two things. It tells you how much money you can spend and it tells you how much money you should save. A good financial plan does three things. It tells you how much money you can spend, it tells you how much money you need to invest, and it tells you how much money you need to save. A great financial plan automates your good financial plan. You got to come up with the best ratio of spending, investing, and saving for you, or you can follow our 75-15-10 or 50-30-20 plans. If you are older and you have financial responsibilities, you can follow our 75-15-10 plan, which says that for every dollar that you earn, you can spend a maximum of 75 cents. You should be investing a minimum of 15 cents, and you should be saving a minimum of 10 cents. If you are younger and you don't have financial responsibilities, this is your time to double down and build your wealth, so you can follow our 50 30 20 plan which says that for every dollar that you earn you can spend a maximum of 50 cents you should be investing a minimum of 30 cents and you should be saving a minimum of 20 cents the easiest way to force yourself to stick with your plan is to automate it and create two or three different bank accounts one bank account is going to be your checking account this is the money that you can spend one bank account is your savings account this is your money that you're saving for emergencies and one bank account could be for your investment money i say that one bank account could be for your investment money because it depends on your financial goals. Some of you might just want to be very passive investors where every month a percentage of your paycheck is automatically invested for you and you don't want to be hands-on with your money. If that's you, then you don't need a separate bank account for your investment money because this money can automatically be withdrawn from your checking account and just go straight to your investment account. If you want to be more active with your investments and you want to pick and choose what your investments are, then it helps to have a third bank account where you take the cash that you want to invest and put it into this bank account. That way you can easily see how much cash you have waiting 
spending to be invested. The reason it helps to have a different bank account for your spending money and your saving money and your investment money is because you don't want to accidentally spend your investment money on a new TV. Your spending account has all the money that you're allowed to spend. So this is the money you can spend on your rent, your mortgage, your groceries, charity, and everything else. Once the spending money is gone, you're not allowed to spend any more money. That's it. You got to know how to live below your means. Your investment money is the money that you're using to build your wealth faster. You can use your investment money to pay down your debt faster. You can use it to buy stocks or real estate or start your own business. The main thing with your investment money is this money needs to be used to buy assets, which are things that pay you. You do not want to use your investment money to buy liabilities, which are things that just take money away from you. And your saving money is your emergency cushion. This is the money that you can tap into if you run into a tragedy or if you lose your job. This is the cash that you have to protect you from these emergencies. But here's the catch. You don't want to just save your money just to save it forever, okay? Your savings are losing value to inflation, so you want to be thinking bigger. Once you have six months worth of expenses saved for an emergency, this is not money that you're saving for a down payment on a home or something else. This is just cash you're saving for an emergency. Once you have six months of these expenses saved, now you want to start thinking about reallocating the saving money either to your investment or maybe a little bit to your spending money too. Making a budget is the easy part. The hard part is sticking with it. Thankfully, we're in a digital age and you can turn your good budget into a great budget by automating this whole process. If you know that $5,000 are coming into your bank account every single month, then you can create automatic transfers that move 15% of this $5,000 or $750 into your investment account and you can move 10% of this $5,000 or $500 into your savings account automatically. Now you're putting your money to work in the right places before you even get a chance to spend it. Now when it comes to spending, you are forced to live below your means because you have less cash left over in your spending account. Your savings are slowly building you a cushion that way you have something to fall back on in case an emergency happens. And for your investments, well, this is where you need to know yourself and your risk tolerance. The most risk-free way to invest your money is to pay down your debt faster because if you're paying 6% a year in interest on your student loans and you pay off your student loans a year early, well, you just got a guaranteed 6% return on your money because that's 6% in interest that you don't have to pay to your bank. If you want to be more of an active investor but you don't really want to go into the details of analyzing companies and stocks, then you can look into investing in index funds. You can think of an index fund kind of like a group of stocks. When you go out and you invest in individual companies or stocks, there's a risk that the company that you invest in is going to go bankrupt. And if that happens, your investment is going to go to zero and your investment money is going to be gone. But if you invest in index funds, now you're not investing in individual companies, you're investing in a fund that invests in a whole bunch of companies. Now, even if one company goes bankrupt, you're okay because there's a lot of other companies in the fund to balance that one bad company out. So this is your lower risk way to invest your money into the stock market because now you're not investing in an individual company, you can get exposure to the entire stock market as a whole. If you want to be even more involved with your investments, then you can look at investing into individual companies or my favorite, investing in real estate. This takes more time and effort on your part because if you want to invest in individual companies, you got to be doing your research to make sure this company is growing and it's a good stock. And if you want to invest in real estate successfully, you got to build a team, you got to know the location, and you got to make sure your tenants are paying rent. Being more active with your investments comes with more risk, but it also comes with more potential return. Look, investing is not a guaranteed thing, okay? You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. You might even lose money, which is why you have to do your own due diligence, and it's why you want to never blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. But now you're building a financial healthy lifestyle that way you can live a wealthy life. It's not easy and it's not a quick overnight thing but it will work if you stick with it and you work for it. If you want to get your finances in order, the first thing you need to do is not hire an expensive money coach or financial planner or financial advisor. The first thing you need to do is just track your money. Once you're tracking money, you want to make some adjustments to how you're spending your money. Once you make those adjustments, make sure you're implementing those adjustments and then rinse and repeat. As you start to get your money in order, that's when you can start doing the fancy stuff. Maybe getting a financial advisor, maybe getting a money coach, maybe reading a whole bunch of financial books, maybe then start going out and figuring out how you want to invest your money. But the very first thing you got to do is you got to start tracking your money. And that means I want you just to go out and get a piece of paper, get a Google sheet, use an Excel sheet, does not matter. And at the very top, you got to write your income. Now, if you have multiple sources of income or if you have multiple incomes in your household, Write them down here. Where is your money coming in from? Is it your job, your W-2? Is it your side hustles? Is it your business? Is it your investment income? Wherever the income is, write it down right here. That way you know exactly how much money you made over the last month. You wanna do this month by month, that's probably the easiest way to do this. Then, once you got a total number for your income, 
The next thing you want to do is you're going to write down your expenses. Now, same concept. You're going to take out your bank statements. You're going to take out your debit card statements. You're going to take out your credit card statements. I want you to take a look at all of your expenses. And the reason why it's easier for you to use a Google Sheet or Excel Sheet is because it's going to be easier for you to categorize these a little bit later on. But if you like paper, that's fine. Now, take out all of these and you need to know exactly where every penny went. How much money did you spend on restaurants? How much money you spend on groceries? How much money you spend on vacations? How much money you spend on your rent or your mortgage? How much money did you spend on your utilities? How much money did you spend on Netflix and everything in between? Write each one of these down. Then ideally you will categorize these and then you're gonna write down your total expenses. Then below that, you're gonna write your other numbers here. How much money did you save? How much money did you invest? And how much money did you give to charity? Once you have this right here, now you have a financial spreadsheet showing you what's going on with your money. Because most people, and I'm just saying this generally, I'm saying this statistically, most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, have absolutely no idea of how much money they're making, how much money they're spending, where they're spending their money, how much are they saving, and how much are they investing, and how much are they giving to charity. Start with this. Once you do this, I can immediately guarantee that as soon as you see this, you're gonna to wanna to make some adjustments. I don't even have to tell you what to do. And the reason why is because when you do this, you're grading yourself and you're gonna see, holy crap, how much money did I just spend at restaurants last month? How much money did I spend going out on my car last month? How much money did I spend on groceries last month? And immediately, you're gonna start making some changes. Because when you see how much money you spend at groceries, maybe you're gonna start creating a grocery list. And you're gonna say, unless it's on my grocery list, I don't buy this thing at the grocery store. If you see that you spent $600 at Benihana's last month, you're gonna say, okay, I'm not eating out this month. I'm gonna go and cook my own meals this month. So I don't wanna give you a blanket statement of how you start spending your money yet, because I want you to number one, track your money. Then number two, I want you to make adjustments on how you wanna start spending your money. And these adjustments that you make are gonna depend on what your financial statements look like. Then number three is I want you to actually implement these things. That means now you have the statement for last month. What do you think you're gonna do next month? Yes, you're gonna do this again. That means month after month, and it shouldn't take you that long after you do it the first time. The first time, it's gonna take you the longest. The second time, it's gonna take you a little bit less time. But by the third time, you're gonna be able to do it in 15 to 30 minutes. Every month, you wanna make a little sheet of how much money you're making and what's going on with your money. That way you can understand what's going on with your money because it's gonna help you make better decisions with your money. Then, it's number four, rinse and repeat. Because now what's gonna happen is once you take a look at this two months down the line, you're gonna have a much better financial grasp of your money. You're gonna see how much money you're making, you're gonna know what your expenses are like, you're gonna have a better control of your expenses, and now you're gonna be looking at, how can I optimize my expenses? How many of these bills can I renegotiate? How many of these bills can I get rid of because I'm not using them before? Can we downsize the car? Do we really need a car this expensive that takes premium gas that has $782 a month just in the monthly payment without including all the other fees? Can you downgrade on these items? And these are the questions you're gonna start answering when you get to month two and month three, and I don't have to tell you what to do. You have to start with this if you wanna get your finances in order because most people's financial statements look like this. You make money, you spend money, and then you wonder where all of your money went. And then everybody says, Oh, okay, well, I'm making some money. I got to get my money in order. I have no real wealth. I have no real investments. I want to get my life in order. I want to have some cash in the bank. Maybe I should start investing my money. And so now you have this financial statement going on right here. And then the next thing that people do is they go open a stock brokerage account. Now I'm going to start throwing some money to the stock brokerage. You put aside $1,000 and now you put $1,000 into the stock brokerage account and you can say, I'm now going to become wealthy with this $1,000 investment. What stock should I buy? And now you go out and buy a stock that you read online that you think is a good investment. And then when the stock goes down in value to $780, you wonder what the heck is going on in the world. You thought that investing was supposed to make you richer, but now you just lost 200 some dollars by putting your money into what you thought was a good investment. This is how most people become and stay broke. It's not because you're not investing your money to the right places, it's because you have no system of what to do with your money. Once you got this in order, the next thing you wanna do is create a few different bank accounts. I like to say that you need to have at least three different bank accounts. A bank account for your spending money, a bank account for your savings money, and a bank account for your investments money. And the reason why you wanna keep these in separate bank accounts is because if you keep all of your money in one bank account, how do you know which money is supposed to be invested? 
which money is supposed to be saved for an emergency, and which money is supposed to be spent. And you might say, oh, I'm good on the money. I know that this $3,000 that's in there is just for my savings, and this $8,000 there is for my investments, and the other money I can spend. Well, when it's all in one bank account, it's very easy to accidentally spend your savings money, and it's very easy to accidentally finance your investment money. And this is why you want to go out and create three different bank accounts. And what you can do now, thanks to technology, is many banks will allow you for free to create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way now when you get paid in one bank account, you can automatically have some of this money move to your second bank account. So you have three different bank accounts. This is where all your money gets deposited when you get paid. Then anytime you get paid, you can create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way a percentage of this money goes into your investment money and a percentage of this investment goes into your savings account. Now you're separating your money that way you cannot accidentally spend your investing money and you can't accidentally spend your savings money. Now this is where everybody asks, well, how do I invest my money and where do I invest my money? I'm not gonna go too deep into investing in this video, but we have a full ebook on how do you invest your money at Briefs Media titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor. And this starts from the basics of how do you build the mindset of an investor to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars, but then it gets a little bit more advanced going over different investing ideas. How do you invest for cash flow? What are different investing strategies? To how do you spend your money smartly? To then how do you earn more money? To then how do you protect your assets? There's a ton of value in this ebook. You can read this ebook completely for free. All you gotta do is click the link down in the description below or go to briefs.co slash ebook. The biggest shift here when it comes to getting a hold of your finances, turning your money around and becoming wealthy isn't just creating some financial system and building some financial education. It's also about the mindset of money because a lot of times we grew up with no financial education and no idea of how we're supposed to use and spend our money. And so most people assume now when you start making money is you gotta go out and spend your money. This is America's consumerism mentality. Hate it or love it, that is what it is. And it's great for people who understand this because now you own the businesses, you own the investments that profit when people spend their money. But when you don't understand this, you're the one that's spending all their money, going into debt to make the rest of the country rich at your expense. And that's why it is so important for you to understand this because if you don't understand this, you're the reason why everybody else gets to drive around in the nice cars. You're the reason everybody else gets to fly around in the private jets and fly first class. You're the reason everybody has those nice homes. It's because you keep spending all of your money. It's because you keep going into debt to make other people rich before you make yourself rich. That means, number one, if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you can't go out and spend $1,000. And that means if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you cannot afford a $1,000 jacket. You cannot afford a $1,000 handbag. You cannot afford a $1,000 iPhone. Because there's a difference between being able to afford something and being able to buy something. See, most people assume that if I got $50 in the bank and I wanna buy a $1,000 phone and it's a $40 a month payment, I can afford the phone because I can afford the $40 monthly payment. But being able to afford something and being able to make the monthly payments are two completely different things. And now, if you wanna be able to actually afford it, that means you gotta be able to buy the whole thing without having to finance it. The only exception to this that I would make is the home that you live in. But now, when it comes to buying things like a phone, buying things like a car, buying things like a sofa, buying things like a TV, stop financing it. Buy it with cash. Yes, including that car too. The reason why so many Americans are broke, if you had to just pick one item, it's because of how much money people are spending on their car. More and more Americans now have a $1,000 monthly car payment. I think it was 20% of all Americans who have a car payment have at least a $1,000 a month car payment. That is a whole rent payment for a lot of the country. So now when you're spending $1,000 a month just on the car payment, the next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive gas. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of insurance. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of oil changes. And then the next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of maintenance on top of all of that. So it's not just a $1,000 a month car payment you gotta pay, now you're paying $3,000 a month just to keep up with this car. So now if you wanna break out of that, go out and buy a used car with cash. If you were gonna put $8,000 down to go out and finance this nice car, take the eight grand, go out and buy a car with cash. Yeah, it's not as nice, but you don't gotta worry about the payments. Now you take those payments and you reinvest it back into yourself. But then you're gonna say, but just breathe, if I have $1,000 in my bank account, why can't I buy a $1,000 jacket? Or a $1,000 iPhone? Or a $1,000 handbag? I mean, if I have $1,000, I can actually afford it, right? Well, kind of. Yeah, you can buy it. But if you really want to be able to afford it, you can't spend all of your money to buy this thing. That's why one of the things I like to follow is a simple rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. 
Now, you start to really change the way you think about spending your money. If you got $1,000 in your bank account, that means the most you can buy is a $200 phone, or a $200 jacket, or a $200 handbag. And that way now you're not spending all of your money. It changes the way you think. Now at first you're gonna say, well how the heck am I supposed to afford a lifestyle if I start to live so much smaller? Well, you'll find a way. Because if the government were to tax you tomorrow, impose a brand new 30% tax on your income, what are you gonna do? You're gonna kick, complain, scream, cry, and then you're gonna find a way to pay it. And that's exactly what you gotta do right now, is you gotta find a way in the beginning to live smaller. Now, I'm gonna say this again, the goal is not to live small for the rest of your life. The goal is not to sit there and pinch pennies for the rest of your life. Pinching pennies is never gonna make you wealthy because at the end of the day, a penny saved is just a penny. But you gotta start by understanding how to control your spending before you start worrying about how you can earn more money because if you start earning more money without knowing how to control the spending, well now you end up in a bigger financial hole. And this is what we see happen for so much of America is people work to get a raise, they work to get a promotion, they work to get a bonus, you make some more money, now you start driving a faster car. You live in a bigger home. You go on a more expensive vacation because you make more money. And this is where you gotta understand why you're working to make more money. Because what wealthy people are doing in this economic system is you're working to make more money to buy more investments. And if you can buy more investments, these investments will continue to make you money because of the way our economic system works. And now if these investments are making you more money, well now you can take the money your investments make and start to use that to live a bigger lifestyle. And this takes time to do. The reason why so many people don't wanna do this is because, well, it's gonna take me a long time to start making any money from my investments. And you're 100% right. That's why I call it a decade of sacrifice. But if you can put in that decade of living smaller and working to earn more money, that way you can invest more aggressively, after a decade, you're gonna have a whole new stream of income, maybe a whole new asset that's producing more money for you that you can start using to live a better life. But most people are not willing to put in that time. Most people are not willing to put in that work. Most people are not willing to put in the effort or make those sacrifices. And that's why most people will never become wealthy. And that's why most people will continue to complain and hate the system. Now, the problem with that is, that's never gonna actually help you with your financial situation. Complaining and hating and bringing everybody else down and bringing down the rest of the world, it's not gonna help you feed your family. It's not gonna help you take your kids to Disney World. It's not gonna help you buy your spouse the handbag that he or she wants. If you wanna be able to have the nice things financially, you gotta go out and get more money. And that means you gotta understand how to use your money smartly. That's the first step. And that means number one, you gotta understand how to track your money. Once you can start tracking your money, you make the adjustments, you start implementing, and you keep working on this, then you gotta figure out how can you control the spending. Once you can figure out how to control the expenses, because now you got the income coming in, you gotta control these expenses so you have more money to invest, then is how can you earn more money? And this is where things start to get fun. Because now the question is, how do you go from $40,000 a year to $400,000 a year? And at first you might hear that and say, how in the world can somebody like me go from 40 to 400? That doesn't make any sense. But when you start asking that question, you're gonna start looking for new answers. Now you're gonna start watching different YouTube videos. You're gonna start watching YouTube videos on how do you earn more money? How do you start a business? How do you start a side hustle? How can you increase your income? How can you change your career? How can you get a new certificate? And then you can start doing different things. And as you start doing different things, now you're gonna start seeing your income change as well. It's not gonna happen overnight. This is a process. Remember, a decade of sacrifice is more than just six months. We're talking about a decade of work, effort, time and learning to put in the work, to put in the effort. That way you can start getting the rewards of your effort after putting in the work, after putting in the time. Most people put in the work for six months and say, where's my reward? But you gotta keep coming back, putting in the reps and understand now, what are the questions you gotta ask? Because once you can control this, then it's all about how can you grow this? And as you grow this, remember, the key is to grow how much money you're putting into your investments. If you can grow how much money you're putting into your investments, you're gonna be able to grow how much wealth you will be able to build, and if you can own more assets, then you also get to buy more freedom. If your goal is to generate quote unquote passive income, then one of the most accessible ways to do that is by investing your money into dividend paying stocks. But most people are investing in dividend stocks the wrong way. When most people think about investing in dividends, they're looking for a company that's paying out the highest dividend because the highest dividend means the biggest paycheck that you're gonna get without having to do any work. And that makes sense in theory, but it doesn't always work out the way that you expect. Let me show you what I mean. The AT&T company has been known as one of the best dividend paying stocks for a number of years. But even if they're paying out strong dividends like they're doing at the time of recording this video, if the stock chart looks like this, 
that can make you nervous as an investor. Now, I'm not saying if AT&T is a good stock or a bad stock. What I'm saying is if your goal is to be a dividend investor, there are some tricks that you can use to find good investments that will allow you to generate cash flow without having to consistently keep monitoring your investments because the goal isn't just to generate cash flow, it's to own a good asset that's hopefully growing in value that's also growing in the cash flow that you're generating. So if your goal is to supplement or completely replace your job income with your dividend income, let me go over a couple tricks that you can use to lower some of your potential risk as an investor. That way you can continue to get steady and healthy cash flow from your investments. Now, of course, investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point. So make sure you always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. And of course, all the stocks and funds that I discussed today are just as examples. They are not recommendations. Strategy number one is to look at a company's dividend history. Now, while this cannot perfectly guarantee what's going to happen in the future, it can give you some sort of idea of what a company's done in the past. Let me show you. In the dividend game, you have different categories or classes of dividend paying companies. For example, you have dividend achievers, dividend champions, and dividend kings. And all these do is kind of just categorize stocks based off of how long they've been paying out dividends and for how long they've been increasing their dividends over the past. So for example, a company becomes a dividend achiever if they have paid out and increased their dividend every year for at least the last 10 years. A company becomes a dividend champion if they have paid out and increased their dividend every year for at least the last 25 years. And a company becomes a dividend king if they have paid out and increased their dividend every year over the last 50 years. Now you can see that it becomes a little bit more difficult as you go down this list, but now you can start to do your research by looking at companies that have been paying out and increasing their dividends year after year after year. Now you might be wondering, but Jaspreet, how do I go out and find a dividend achiever or a dividend king? How do I actually do this research? Well, thankfully, there's this amazing research tool that is actually free called Google. And you can just go to Google and search dividend achievers and you will see a list of dividend achievers in the stock market. Or you can search for dividend champions and you'll see a list of dividend achievers in the stock market. Or you can search dividend kings and you will see a list of dividend kings in the stock market. Now again, you don't want to just blindly throw your money into a company because they've been paying out and increasing a dividend. That's just the first part of your research. But this can give you a little bit of a guideline of if you are looking for a company that has been paying out and increasing the dividends because you want future growth in your dividends, this could be at least some sort of basic starting point for you because if a company has been paying out and increasing the dividends, that could potentially mean that they are a strong company and they are focused on providing steady and strong cash flow to their investors. Will this guarantee you make a good investment? Absolutely not but at least it gives you a starting point. The second strategy that you can consider is not investing into a dividend paying company, but rather invest into a dividend paying fund. Because if you are not interested in this whole game of trying to keep up with a company, researching a company, studying their earnings, and making sure that this company is still a strong company, because sometimes companies do fail, sometimes companies go bankrupt, and if you keep investing your money into a fund for a number of decades, trying to build this cash flow, and then they go bankrupt, not only do you lose their cash flow, but you lose all the money that you invested but there is a way to mitigate some of that risk by now investing your money into a dividend paying fund. Now you can invest your money into a fund that's paying you a dividend and this fund could be made up of dozens or hundreds of companies that way if one of the companies in the fund goes bankrupt, well, it's balanced out by the other winners. So it's a way for you to reduce some of your risk and now you can also mitigate some of your time because you can set up a system where not every week or every two weeks or every month, you're just putting a little bit of money into this fund and now you don't have to keep up with the fund the way that you would if you were investing your money into an individual company because investing your money into individual companies comes with more risk, it comes with more time and you need a little bit more experience if you really want to make money and analyze your investments as opposed to just putting your money into a fund. So let me give an example of what this looks like. So. PFM, again, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just giving you some examples. PFM is an ETF that gives you exposure to dividend aristocrats. Now, if you remember what I said just a minute ago, dividend aristocrats are companies that have paid out and increased their dividends for at least the last 10 years. So now you can look at that list of dividend aristocrats and find some companies that you want to invest in, 
or you can just invest in dividend and aristocrats by investing into this fund like PFM and now you're getting exposure to dividend aristocrats and you don't have to put in the work to try to find the best company. Now at the time I'm recording this video, the PFM ETF invests into about 400 companies. SPYD is an ETF that gives you exposure to dividend paying companies in the S&P 500. The S&P is a group of the 500 largest companies in the stock market. Now out of this group of the 500 largest companies in the stock market, not every single one of them pays a dividend. Maybe you just want to invest in the companies that are paying a dividend, now you can start generating some cash flow. Well, SPYD makes it easier for you because this is a fund that invests in companies in the S&P 500 that are paying out a dividend. At the time of recording this video, SPYD invests into 80 different companies. And then you have VYM, which I should put a little bit of an asterisk here because as a disclaimer, I do personally have some of my own money into VYM. This is an ETF created by Vanguard, which invests in dividend paying companies on the stock market inside of the United States. So it's a little bit broader than this and this, but at the time of recording this video, this has 462 companies in this fund. So now, if your goal is to generate cash flow and you want to build long-term cash flow, which means that now you're going to be consistently investing your money into these dividend paying stocks, you can either invest your money into individual companies or you can invest your money into a fund. If you put your money into a company, well now you run the risk of that company going bankrupt or something bad happening to the company or your stock price going down. But if you put your money into a fund and there are many, 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 many other funds. This is just an example. There are many different funds out there depending on what it is that you want to invest in, what type of exposure that you want. Well now, you don't have that same level of risk. Is there still risk? Yes, but you're mitigating some of the risk because now you're investing in multiple companies. This is where now, if you really want to succeed as an investor, you want to dig a little bit deeper into the whole idea of dividends and why companies pay dividends. And before we jump into that, I do want to let you know that if you are interested in learning more about investing, my team at Briefs Media created this amazing ebook on how to build wealth as an investor that walks you through the basics of first, how do you build the mindset of an investor to getting into more of the complex and advanced stuff of different investing strategies. Strategies, how do you generate cash flow? What are different cash flow ideas? How do you protect your assets? How do you spend your money smartly? This ebook is completely free. So if you want a breakdown of how to build wealth as an investor, this is a free guide that can help you with that. So if you want to read this ebook for free, I got the link to how you can download this ebook down in the description below. Now to understand how dividends really work, let's assume that a company makes $1 billion in revenue by selling their stuff. But this isn't all just profit, they have to have expenses. Like you have to pay for your employees, you got to pay for your rent, you got to pay for your machinery costs and everything in between. And if now the cost of running this business is let's just say $500 million, that means this company at the end of the year will have $500 million in profit. This is cash that's sitting in their bank account at the end of the year. Now when the company, the stock, has this $500 million sitting in their bank account at the end of the year, there's three things that they could potentially do with this cash. Option number one is they save this cash for emergencies. Maybe they want to build in a rainy day fund because we remember when the pandemic happened, companies ran out of money very quickly. So one thing that a company could do is potentially save some of this money. Option number two is they can invest some of this money back into the company. Because now let's say this company wants to open new stores. It wants to open new manufacturing facilities. It wants to invest in research and development. It wants to open a new operation in Asia. Well, in order to do that, you need money. And if a company is trying to grow very quickly, they're going to be very heavily investing this money back into the company. That's why you don't see a lot of startups paying out dividends, it's because they don't actually have any profit. They're investing all this money back into the company and some because they're going out and getting debt. They're trying to find more investors. That way they can grow as big as possible, as fast as possible. But then you have option number three, which is a company can give this money away. Now there's a couple of different ways that a company can give this money away. I'm not talking about giving it away to charity. I'm talking about giving it away to the shareholders, the people that own the stock. Now, the first way that this company can give this money away is by buying back some of their own stock. So if you have $500 million worth of profit, they can now go out and buy $500 million worth of their stock. Now, what does that do? Well, that helps inflate the stock price because if there's more buyers and sellers of the stock, well, then that pushes the stock price up. And the reason why some investors like that is because you don't actually see any cash in your pocket. Because if you just see the stock price of your investment go up, well, you don't have any taxable event because you only pay taxes when you sell or if you get some cash in your pocket. So if the company buys back their own stock, some investors prefer that because it's a way for you to make more money on paper because now your stock price is higher. However, the flip side of that is 
there's a chance that you don't actually see any of that money because then the stock price could go back down. Anything could happen and you don't actually see that money because you don't actually make any money until you sell your stock. So that's where the alternative is they can give it away in the form of a dividend. Now when a company pays out a dividend, it's literally just a cash payment. It means the company is distributing checks, which nowadays are not checks, they deposit it directly into your brokerage account. The company is just distributing this money right into your account and you don't have to do anything to really earn that money except own that stock or own that fund. And the nice thing about this is you can get paid without having to do any work because if you own a stock, you own a company that's paying out a dividend, all you have to do is own the company and now you're getting paid. But there are some cons with that because now you have a taxable event. When you get a dividend, you have to pay taxes on this money. Now you might think, but what if I take this money that I get from my dividend and I reinvest it back into the company or I reinvest it back into the fund, which is actually a really good strategy when it comes to building wealth, especially as a cash flow investor, because now not only are you contributing more money to buy more of this cash flow, but you're using your cash flow to buy more cash flow. It's a great opportunity and it's a great way for you to increase how much cash flow or passive income that some people like to call passive income. I prefer calling it a cash flow because passive income can kind of have a more of a deceptive title to it. But now if you're generating this cash flow and you're reinvesting it, the goal is to generate more cash flow. However, even if you reinvest your dividends, you still have to pay taxes on the income even if you never see it. So yeah, there is some downfalls to investing for dividends because you got to pay taxes, but at least you get that cash in your pocket today and you don't have to actually sell your stock to get any of the money. Personally, I like cash flow investing. For me, I like the security of having cash flow because for me, the game is to stack cash flow, whether it's from stocks, whether it's from real estate. I want to stack the cash flow because now I know that this cash flow is going to keep coming in and then my goal is to be able to live off of the cash flow because if I can use my cash flow to fund my entire lifestyle, well now I'm financially free. I can do whatever I want then I can just keep living off of the cash flow. I can spend my money in whatever dumb way that I want and I know I'm going to get another cash flow check next month or next quarter. Most companies and most funds that are paying out a dividend are paying out their dividends or their cash flow payments every quarter, meaning every three months. Now, the reason why it's really important for you to understand when you're investing for dividends, you're not just investing for the cash flow, you're investing in the underlying asset, is because sometimes that dividend that you're getting can be deceptive. Let me show you what I mean. Let's assume that you want to go out and invest in this XYZ company. I'm not saying this is an actual company, just an example. And at the time, this is trading for $100 a share and it's paying out a $5 dividend, which means it's paying out a 5% dividend yield. Not bad. But then something bad starts to happen in the company. They start to put out a bad product. People stop liking the company. And then the stock price falls to, let's just say, $50 a share. Now, if they haven't adjusted their dividend yet, that means this company is trading for $50 a share. Their dividend is $5, which means now they're not paying out a 5% dividend. They're paying out a 10% dividend. Now at face value, this looks like a much more attractive investment because take a look, you're getting a 10% dividend as opposed to a 5% dividend, but it's not showing you the whole picture because if you look at the whole picture, what you see is yeah, you're getting a 10% dividend, but the stock price has fallen by 50%. So maybe there's something majorly wrong with the company. If you feel like this is a great opportunity to come in and buy this company because they're going to turn it around and you're going to see the stock price soar, then sure, it could potentially be a good investment. Of course it has risks, but what you want to understand is you are not just buying the cash flow, you are buying the company. And that's why it's so important that when you're doing your dividend analysis, you look beyond just the percentage that you're getting, you look beyond just the dollar amount that you're getting, you look beyond just the share price, you're looking at what the company is and how strong the company is. And that's what should be deciding your investment decisions because you want to invest in the company, not just in the cash flow, because the cash flow number or percentage that you're seeing can be deceiving if you're just looking at that by itself, which is why that is just one piece of your investment decision. You want to look at the actual investment. That way you can make a smart decision for yourself. Now, when it comes to coming up with a strategy for how do you actually invest your money into cash flow producing assets or into stocks that are paying on dividends, one thing that I like to do, you've got to come up with the best strategy for you, is I have funds that I invest in for cash flow. I have ETFs that I invest in for cash flow. And for me, what I do is every Wednesday, cash is pulled out of my checkings account and it's automatically invested into my portfolio of ETFs. This happens automatically, this happens passively, and it happens consistently no matter what, whether the market's up, whether the market's down, this is going to happen because I just want to keep stacking the cash flow. Now, as I get my dividends, I just reinvest my dividends because I don't need my dividends right now. 
But that's the game that I'm doing. That money is automatically being invested for me and now I'm just constantly working to buy more cash flow. Every week, I own more cash flow producing ETFs. And now when my cash flow producing ETFs pay me with dividends, I use those to buy more cash flow producing ETFs. So it's become a machine where now I'm working to generate some income. My income is being used to buy some dividend paying ETFs and then my dividend paying ETFs are buying me more dividend paying ETFs. But of course, you gotta find the right strategy for you. But if you want to use your dividends to replace or supplement your income, you gotta get started. You got to figure out what it is that you want to invest in and then you got to come up with a strategy for you. The majority of people would tell you that liabilities are easy. Liabilities are my credit card debt when I go out and I finance my Gucci, that's a liability. And then they would tell you that your assets are things like the home that I live in, my car, and the cash in my bank. Well, let's talk about that. The assumption that everybody makes here is if you have some equity in your home and your car, that is why it's an asset because, well, that's money sitting in this thing, this asset. So now let's assume that you have a fully paid off home and a fully paid off car. Now you lose your job. Either you get fired or the business you're working in or own goes bankrupt and you no longer have an income coming in. Now what? Well, you have a home and a car, which you think are assets that have equity in them. However, they require payments because your home has property taxes. Your home has property insurance payments. Your home needs maintenance. Your home needs utilities that need to be paid. All these things are money coming out of your pocket. And if you don't have money coming in, you're not going to be able to afford it. Just like your car. You thought it was an asset, but you need to pay for gas. You got to pay for the insurance. You got to pay for the maintenance. So now, if you want to actually get any cash out of this, you have to sell this quote unquote asset. That way you can have some cash in your hand. But if you sell your home, you no longer have it. That means in order to maintain this asset, you have to keep paying to maintain this asset. And then if you have to sell this home or this car, you have to hope that you can sell it for more than what you bought it for to actually make any money because the whole purpose of an asset is to make money, right? Well. If you sell your home and home values are down or in your in a neighborhood where home prices have fallen, well, now you might not be able to get what you bought it for. You might end up losing money on this home, on this thing that you thought was an asset. Same with your car. Cars drop in value. That is a fact. The moment you drive that car off of the lot, it is going to lose 15 to 20 percent of its value immediately. Cars are depreciating liabilities. So now, yeah, you might be able to get some cash out of this thing, but there's a chance you're going to lose money. Same with your home. We've seen home markets go up and we've seen home markets go down. During the 2008 real estate crash time, we saw home prices around the country fall. And so you have markets where real estate prices are going up and you have markets where real estate prices are going down. And if you have to sell your home during a time where real estate markets are down, well now you might be forced to sell this quote unquote asset at a loss. And in order to maintain these assets, you have to keep putting money out of your pocket into this asset to keep it going forward. And now if you really want to make money on this property, not only do you have to factor in all the expenses that you put into the property, the property taxes, the insurance, the maintenance, the utilities, but also all the upgrades you put into this property in order to make it livable for you. But what about the cash that's sitting in your bank account? Now, if we go with the same example, you lose your job. The nice thing is you can fall back on this cash and you can use this cash to fund things. You can use this cash to make your housing payments. You can use this cash to keep paying for your gas. You can use this cash to keep paying for your food, but there still is a problem with that cash. Now let's go back to what do you expect with an asset? You would expect an asset to make you money, right? That's what we hope an asset will do. I'll get to the actual definition of an asset in just a minute, but you would hope that an asset is something that's going to make you money. Well, let's just take a look at the history of money. Let's assume now that we go back in time about 50 years and you were able to put aside $1 million in the year 1973 and that cash just sat there in the bank. Now, if you lost your job, it'll be no big deal because you have a million dollars in the bank that you put aside in 1973. But the problem with that is that in 1973, that one million dollars could buy you a lot more stuff. In fact, if you want to be able to buy the same amount of stuff that a million dollars could back in 1973, you would need almost seven million dollars today. You need about six point nine million dollars today to buy what one million dollars could back in 1973. So that means, yes, this cash still has buying power. This cash can still pay for your food. This cash can still pay for your housing. This cash can still pay for your car. However, the value and buying power of your cash is dropping because of inflation. 
So now, yeah, your cash can still buy you things, but the value of your cash is falling. And this is where now it becomes very important for you as a financially educated person to really understand the difference between an asset and a liability and understand how you can accumulate more real assets that will pay you with real money. That way you could continue growing your wealth because the average person is working for assets like this. They're working to save up more cash, they're working to drive a nice car, and they're working to have a big home to live in. Nothing wrong with having a nice home. Nothing wrong with having a nice car. And you need cash. I mean, you need cash to buy real assets. You need cash to have an emergency saving. But I want you to understand that these things are actually losing in your financial wealth. If you want to become wealthy, what wealthy people do is they're trying to own real assets that will pay for these things and they use this to buy real assets. So let's talk about that. The best definition of a real asset that I can give you is that a real asset is something that will continue to pay you even when you stop working. And I gotta credit Robert Kiyosaki for coming up with the definition of this, but a real asset is something that will continue to pay you even when you stop working. That's why the home that you live in is not a real asset because if you stop working, you still have to keep paying out of your pocket to pay for that home. If you stop working, you just have to pay out of your pocket to drive that car. So your home and your car are not real assets because you have to keep paying out of your pocket to keep supporting these so-called assets. Your cash, on the other hand, doesn't keep paying you. Your cash is not growing. We just saw that over the last 50 years that the value of your cash is dropping because the value of each individual dollar is going down. So if you want to own real assets, things that will continue to pay you even if you stop working, that means you have to reframe your mind when it comes to real assets and you need to use the cash that you're working to earn to buy these real assets. So what are these real assets? Well, it could be things like real estate, stocks, and businesses. Real estate stocks and businesses are the three most time-tested and proven assets that have built more wealth for people than really any other asset class. So let's talk about this. Now, I do want to let you know that if you are looking for additional resources to grow your financial education journey and growing your investing education, we have a free ebook called How to Build Wealth as an Investor that you can read for free that my team at Briefs Media wrote. This ebook will walk you through things like how do you build the mindset of a successful investor, to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars, to how do you start investing, what are different types of investments, how do you generate cash flow, how do you invest your money into different investing strategies. And then we go into things like, well, how do you spend your money smartly? To how do you earn your money smartly? To how do you protect your assets? There's a ton of value in this ebook. You can download this ebook for free. So if you want to read this ebook, I got the link for you down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash ebook. My first real exposure to investing into real assets was when I started investing in real estate. Now, I was fortunate. I started investing in real estate in 2011, which was at the bottom of the 2008 real estate cycle, which meant real estate prices were selling for dirt cheap. I didn't know they were selling for dirt cheap, they just were because I had no experience when it came to investing. I had no experience when it came to financial education. I didn't even know that you could invest in real estate until I started doing it in myself because I didn't know anybody investing in real estate. But the way that it works when you invest in real estate is you're going out and you're going to buy a property. Let's say a single family home. And now when you go out and buy this home, you're not buying this home to live in yourself. You are buying this home to rent out to somebody else. You're buying this home for the purposes of generating cash flow because now the goal is you buy this home, Somebody else is going to live there and then they're going to pay you rent every single month. And if you do this correctly, the rent that you're going to generate from this property should not only pay for your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, and your vacancy costs, but it should also put some money in your pocket every single month. So now you own this property, not to live in yourself, but to have somebody else live there. And now this tenant is paying for your expenses. They should also be paying for your mortgage if you have a mortgage on this property and putting some money in your pocket every single month. That means now that this asset is paying you for owning it, as opposed to the home that you live in, which you have to pay to own. Can you sell your home for a profit? Sure, but that's not guaranteed. Here, if you do it correctly, this home should be paying you every single month. When it comes to stocks, the way it works here is you have a number of companies in the world and the United States that when they go to a certain point, they're going to want to either A, get more publicity or B, get some more money or I guess liquidate their assets as well because now they can trade their shares of their company on the public markets. And so when a company gets big enough, they will consider doing what's called an IPO, an initial public offering. And what that means is that this company is now going to trade on the stock market. So now what you can do is instead of just going out and buying stuff on Amazon, instead of just going out and buying Apple products, instead of just going out and spending time on Google, 
you can own a piece of these companies. Now, I'm not recommending any of these companies, but what I'm saying is now you can shift your mindset from just being a consumer to being a producer. And what that means is now you own a piece of the companies where you are already spending your money or your time. And a simple way that you can do this, a simple way for you to start, is if you're going to go out and spend a dollar at a company, spend a dime buying the company. If you're going to go to Chipotle and spend a dollar, spend 10 cents buying a piece of the company. If you're going to spend 10 bucks at wherever, Lululemon, I don't know if you can buy anything for 10 bucks at Lululemon, spend a dollar buying the company. Now, does this mean the company that you're buying is a great company? No, absolutely not. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point because investing has risks and you should always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. But the whole idea here is now you are starting to think like an investor. And the whole idea of thinking like an investor is instead of me going out and spending all my money and buying fake assets, I'm going to use my money to buy real assets. I'm going to use my money to own a piece of equity. I'm going to use my money to own a piece of the economy. But that means you have to start thinking a little bit different. And as soon as you start investing your money, you're going to start changing the way you think because now you have your skin in the game. You have your own money in the game. And you don't want to see yourself lose money. Unfortunately, losing money is a part of the process. But when you invest your own money, that's when you're going to start getting more serious about paying attention to where it is that you're investing. Now, you might say, but just but I am not interested in researching companies. I'm not interested in studying financials. I'm not interested in reading profit and loss statements. I'm not interested in studying balance sheets. I'm not interested in studying cash flow statements. I don't want to do any of that. Well, you don't have to because in the stock market, there are things called funds. Now, there's a few different types of funds. I don't want to get too technical in this video, but you have things like ETFs index funds and mutual funds and all that means is that these funds will allow you to buy a piece of a lot of companies by just buying a piece of that fund so now for example there are funds that will give you exposure to the s p 500 the s p 500 is a group of the 500 largest companies in the stock market now instead of you going out and trying to find the best companies you could just invest in the largest 500 companies in the stock market there are funds that will give you exposure to the entire stock market. We've seen the stock market grow over the last century. But many times people will go out and try to invest in the best company and see that company go bankrupt or see that company go down and wonder why they keep losing their money. Well, if you don't know how to invest, if you don't know how to research, if you don't want to do that work, you can just invest in funds that will give you exposure to the total stock market. There are funds that will give you exposure to technology companies. There are funds that will give you exposure to AI companies. There are funds that will give you exposure to healthcare companies. There are funds that will give you exposure to international companies. There are funds that will give you exposure to dividend paying companies. I mean, you have funds for everything. And so now, instead of you trying to go out and find the perfect company, one other thing that you could also consider doing, if it's right for you, is even potentially invest in funds that where you just own a piece of the economy without having to do all the work because the reality is if you want to succeed as an investor you got to be willing to put in some work to actually research what it is that you're putting your money into otherwise it's almost like gambling option number three is business now this can be your own business or buying somebody else's business if you're going to buy somebody else's business it's going to take the most time and the most money if you're going to build your own business well that takes the most time and then as you start to grow the business you're going to want to reinvest your own business's money back into the business now this one is the most difficult and has the highest barrier to entry i mean you can start investing in stocks with as little as a hundred dollars or ten dollars even one dollars for some apps now Investing in real estate takes more money than investing in stock. You would need at least somewhere between thirty dollars to $50,000 to get started as a real estate investor. I mean, could you start investing with less? I'm sure you could. But if you want to be able to start comfortably, I would say you need at least thirty dollars to $50,000 to start investing in real estate. To go out and build a business, you don't need a ton of money to start. But you're going to need time, and you're going to have to be willing to take risks, and you're going to have to be willing to dedicate yourself to building a business. I can tell you from experience, building Briefs Media, that building a business unlike what a lot of people say on the internet, it's not something that you can do just here and there if you want to see real success with that business. I mean, sure, if you want to just build a side hustle, you could do that. But if you really want to build a real multi-million dollar business, if you want to build a real sustainable business, it takes time. It takes hard work. It takes risk. Now, does that mean it's impossible? No, absolutely not. Anybody can actually do it, but it takes a lot of effort, which most people are not willing to put in. And that means you got to be willing to learn. So now the whole idea here is you're going to produce an income production machine. You're going to create this income production machine. Here in real estate, you're buying this income producing machine. Here with stocks, you're buying the income producing machine. Right? The income producing machine here is that home that you're buying. That home is going to produce income. You just got to get somebody to live there and pay you rent. 
and you can have a property management company help you with that. With stocks, you're buying a piece of the income producing machines that already exist. Here, you're creating the income producing machine or you're gonna have to buy out one of these income producing machines. Now, I recommend entrepreneurship to anybody who's willing to put in the work, to anybody who wants to do that, but anybody who doesn't want to be an entrepreneur, anybody who doesn't want to put in the effort, anybody who doesn't want to put in the hard work, anybody who wants an easy lifestyle, I do not recommend entrepreneurship for you. So this one is really you know, up to you. You know, it, there's nothing wrong with being an employee. There's nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur. I love entrepreneurship just because that's the way that my brain works. But if that's not how your brain works, then don't go down this route. However, this has been one of the most time-tested and proven ways for people to build wealth. But if you can't do this, then you can do this and this as a way now for you to invest in other income-producing machines. But the key is now, if you want to build wealth, you have to stop just buying the fake assets and start buying real assets. Because if you were ever to stop making money, if you were to ever stop working, would your fake assets continue to pay you or would your real assets continue to pay you? Investing in a ticker symbol as opposed to a company. They think, wow, this stock is paying out a 10% annual dividend. Let me just throw all my money into the stock because I'm gonna make 10% of it back every single year. But if you're getting a 10% annual dividend while the stock price is falling 20% a year, you are in a losing situation. But if you know what you're doing, you have the opportunity 